What happened to Justin Shetler, a 30-something adventurer who disappeared in the mountains of India? Harley Brostad will be here to talk about Lost in the Valley of Death, a story of obsession and danger in the Himalayas. And what would happen if the state could penalize mothers for not being good enough parents? Jasmine Chan will join us to talk about her best-selling novel, The School for Good Mothers. Alexander Alter will be here to talk about what's going on in the publishing world. Plus, my colleagues and I will talk about what we're reading. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. It's February 11th. I'm Pamela Paul. Harley Rustad joins us now from Toronto. He is the author of Big Lonely Doug, the story of one of Canada's last great trees. And his latest book is called Lost in the Valley of Death, a story of obsession and danger in the Himalayas. Harley, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start with the key figure in your book. Who was Justin Alexander Shetler? So Justin was a 35-year-old American traveler who arrived in India in the summer of 2016. And unlike a lot of travelers who visit that country, he wasn't immediately drawn to places like the Taj Mahal or, you know, the beaches of Goa, but to the mountains, to the Himalayas. And this one tiny corner specifically called the Parvati Valley, which is named after the Hindu goddess of love and devotion. And three years before, Justin had quit his job, gave away his belongings, and set out on this really indefinite journey by motorcycle initially around the U.S. and then internationally, all the while building up this sizable, at that time, sizable following on social media, on Instagram and YouTube. And this journey that ultimately led him to India. And he arrived with really a deep intention, a very specific goal of going to the mountains and living in a cave, these sites that have been throughout history, places of great transformation and revelation, to test himself, to push himself. And in the valley, he found not only his perfect cave that he lived in for a month, but this pilgrimage, this guide, a a Hindu holy man, a sadhu, to lead him on this journey to the glacial source of the Parvati River, this place called Mantalai Lake, which is where Justin ultimately vanished. I'm going to wind way back on that path to the tech startup 2013. What was he doing there and why did he leave? What made him become, as you described him, a traveler and a, a traveler of a very particular type? He was the kind of person that was sort of constantly reinventing himself and a bit like a chameleon would put on a new skin to see what kind of expressions could be found in that occupation or in that place. And so he he grew up when he was a teenager, he grew up in, in these wilderness circles, these academies of survivalism and wilderness awareness and natural study. And he threw himself into that and worked his, his way up very successfully within those circles. And then moved to San Francisco and started a a punk band, this quite successful punk band called Punch Face in San Francisco, ultimately did that for a few years. And then he once again was presented with this opportunity to be the traveling face of this tech company based out of Miami, which is, he was originally from Florida, and moved there and for three years lived this life of glitz and you know, high-flying, staying in fancy hotels and eating in Michelin-starred restaurants and making quite a lot of money and ultimately realized that none of that was deeply fulfilling him and had this moment of what truly fulfills me is, is independence and freedom and a life on the road and exploration. And so he had this, in some ways, quite classic break from the path that had been set before him and gave up everything and hit the road. But it sounds like there was a little bit of this in his childhood experience. I mean, what were these wilderness programs? Who were his parents? His parents separated when when he was 11, and, and he was largely raised by his mom through his teenage years, but very quickly got into these wilderness schools and so was boarding at this school just outside of Seattle in Washington State and in some ways found that elusive father figure, that elusive mentor within these schools, 
in these legendary figures within these circles. And that had a deep impact on him, not only kind of crystallizing his worldview, but also shaping his spiritual attitude as somebody who was brought up in a very religiously fluid household, influences from his father, who had these big experiences in India, incorporated Hinduism and Buddhism into his life, and his mother, who was this follower of Ekankar, this a slightly obscure religion. In part, Justin's search was to try to make sense of all of these questions that had long been in his mind. Is there a higher power? And what is my connection to that? To what extent would you say that the spiritual component motivated his journeys? I think a large part. I think there was, since he was a, a young kid and, and a teenager, there was this longing to understand his place in the universe. And if there was a higher power out there, be it God or Shiva or Mother Nature or what have you, and to be able to really feel that. I think he was a, a skeptical person. I think he was a very curious person. And I think he represents a lot of things that are quite universal right now. This, These people who identify not as religious, but as spiritual in this, this kind of great spectrum of what makes sense for me. And I will take different parts from different religious teachings and, and different parts from around the world to create this spiritual conglomerate of what do I believe in? And I think Justin... In part, his travels were a, a means to that end, to find these teachers, to find these expressions, to put together something that really resonated within him, a worldview, his own spirituality, and his own perspective on him and his relation to something bigger. So there's that, and then there's this curious mix with the tech startup side of himself and with his social media presence, which is still up there. We'll talk about that more later. And you you look at his Instagram, for example, he's this, I just have to say it, like very good looking, muscular guy who seems to be aware of his physical presence. And he's in a lot of these photos. It's not just of the scenery. Talk a little bit about how he approached social media and, and the relationship between that and this spiritual journey. He was a very good looking guy. And I think if you go to his Instagram account, which is still active and still live, I think he's somebody that could potentially be quite easy to roll your eyes at and write off. You know, there are a fair amount of shirtless selfies on his Instagram account. But I think it's quite easy for people to write him off as somebody who was just out there for fame and recognition to have an enormous following and to kind of reap the personal and potentially financial benefits of what that could bring you. But I don't think that's entirely a truthful read of who Justin was. And I think that is a very common thing. We all present ourselves as a larger-than-life figure, or we at least curate what we want to present ourselves to the world. And that's not necessarily truthful. That's not necessarily accurate to who we are. And it's almost like Justin, and because he was entering this world in 2013, really, Instagram influencers were just starting to monetize their content. It was just starting to really explode. And it was almost as if he was, he had put himself onto this train and it was starting to run away with him. And he had no idea whether or not this was going to end up as a force for good or a force for evil. And I think there was something that he was deeply trying to search for and that the, his social media accounts while they gave him a platform to potentially inspire people, something that he really, really longed for and struggled with was solitude. And right now, it is, it's almost impossible to, to achieve that true solitude in this world of deep, profound connectivity. And so as much as he validated and found value in that platform, it also was impossible. It created this barrier for him to achieve something pure, isolation, and what can be found in those moments of solitude. I didn't mean to sound overly dismissive of his Instagram, Adventures of Justin, because one thing that struck me, at least in looking, especially at those last posts, it's it's haunting to see his presence there and, and those last posts. Could you just describe a bit about what those final posts say and ultimately told you in your research, figuring out what happened in his last days? So he, essentially, wherever he traveled, he he posted photographs and stories to Instagram. He created these 
you know, really quite beautiful, wordless videos that he uploaded to YouTube. And, you know, he was interviewed by blogs and all sorts of stuff as his name grew. And as a journalist, as a reporter who's trying to piece together this puzzle of somebody's life, his social media was a a very rich resource. It had timestamps and, you know, locations and people that I could interview who were tagged in his posts. And it was this enormous, enormous resource for somebody who was following his trail. But it also presented a, a problem, as I said, about where the truth lies and what is posted. Was that picture posted at that exact time? And is the story that it is representing and presenting truthful and accurate? And so there were some challenges there. And I, I had these moments where he told a story online that I then had to pick apart. And I found flaws and inconsistencies in that story. And I found that deeply, deeply fascinating and added this whole other layer to his story. When and how did you first encounter Shetler and his story? Really, I encountered the place before the person. I first went to India in 2008 as kind of this classic post-university graduate, having no idea what I want to do with my life, you know, head to India and hopefully I will find some answers and direction. And I had heard about, at that time during that trip, I had heard about this place called the Parvati Valley. And I never went during that trip, but it was presented as this place of unparalleled beauty of kind of classic Himalayan life, this intimacy with the mountains, but also this place with this really dark, tragic history, a place where since the early 1990s, dozens of international backpackers have mysteriously vanished, almost one every year. And so in the fall of 2016, because I had spent a couple of years in India, had kept in touch with Indian media and came across the latest person to disappear in the valley. And when I found his social media, I realized that this was a story not just about one person who had disappeared, the latest person in this tragic, dark history, but about somebody who had a fascinating backstory, had a very complicated backstory, and whose story raised a lot of very current issues. And so very quickly, it drew me in very intensely. What are some of the issues that it raised for you, his story? One of the ones that we've talked about is, is how we present ourselves online today and the differences between how we want to live an authentic, truthful life that is honest to ourselves and to our history and to our identity, but how we present ourselves online and where those discrepancies are, where those flaws are. And I was just fascinated by that. And Justin spoke to that so perfectly. I think it also was this, in some ways, a classic story of an adventurer gone missing. And, you know, lots of parallels can be made to Into the Wild's Christopher McCandless and, you know, people like Everett Ruiz, who disappeared, another young man to disappear that time in the American Southwest in the 1930s. And in some ways, it was that classic story. But to me, what really drew me in was that this was sort of an updated 21st century version of that story that talked about the challenges of presenting yourself on social media, these the kind of deep longing to better understand ourselves spiritually, and also this new generational angst that I think Ruiz spoke to, McCandless spoke to, and I think Shetler speaks to that as well. This very 21st century issues that we all kind of struggle with in terms of connectivity, finding isolation, the challenges of social media, the pressures of social media, enormous pressures on social media that I, that I think deeply affected Justin. So there are two threads here that I think are of perpetual interest. One is that eternal interest that some people have to go off to have this journey of self-discovery, to travel, to leave home, to have this great adventure. And then the second related one is our desire to read about those stories, especially when the adventures go wrong. And I'm curious to what extent those two threads played into this narrative. In some ways, it's the universality of those stories, that there are forces, that there are issues that these people represent, and that I think we all can kind of relate to. And I think that touches something really human and, and makes people really draws them into these, these types of stories. And what I think also deeply affects us is that they are 
sometimes the more extreme versions of something that we've all thought about. There's a long, long history of people who have dreamed of going to live in an ashram in India or meet their guru. And a lot of people who have done just that in literature, tons and tons of stories, this, this deep history of that. What Justin's story represents, and he may have taken that desire, that kernel, and taken it to its furthest extreme, to an extreme that I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily take it. But I think what, what that taps into for most people is an expression of something that we all hold quite dear, which is this, this searching, this, this desire, this curiosity to better understand the world and our place in it. And that is something that everybody feels, regardless of where you're from. We all want to know where we fit into this great maelstrom, this great kind of chaos of the world. Where do we fit into this? What is our place? What is our role? What legacy are we going to leave behind? Whether that's family or a career or or what have you. And I think it's th those types of things that the average person can pick up and, and latch onto and really identify with, even though these people may take it to the wilds of Alaska or you know, the deep Himalayas in India. I think we all want to know what happened to Justin Alexander Shetler, but I'm, I'm not going to ask you to reveal that on this podcast. People can read the book. But just one quick question about that legacy. When you look back now at his Instagram, at his social media presence, having researched the book and written the book, what strikes you about it now that maybe you didn't see the first time? I first reported on this story for Outside Magazine, and that article was largely an investigation into what happened in India and the search to find answers. His family flew to India and his friends flew to India, and there's this enormous search in the U.S. to, to try to find clues, and I detail that in the book. When I started working on, on a much bigger version of that story, a much deeper one, I think what surprised me were some of those relatable aspects to it. For me, looking at, you know, a budding social media star, I don't see a lot of myself necessarily in that. And I grew up really in a non-religious household. And so I didn't necessarily think that I was going to connect so deeply with some of those torments, really, some of those issues that Justin was grappling with quite as deeply as I did working in this book. And in part, that had to do with the research I did, the reading I did, but also to really put myself in, in Justin's shoes and in certain experiences and in certain perspectives that he had. And that really opened my eyes to some of these conflicts and some of these issues that he was working through that I never really felt like I would come across or I was always perhaps hesitant to. And that really did surprise me. All of that comes through in the narrative. I will leave it to listeners to discover the rest of the story themselves. Harley, thank you so much again for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Harley Rustad's new book is called Lost in the Valley of Death, A Story of Obsession and Danger in the Himalayas. So here's a request for our listeners. I get lots of feedback from you, some complaints, lots of kind words. Really appreciate it. You can always reach me directly at books at nytimes.com. I will write back. But you can also, if you feel moved to do so, review us on any platform where you download the podcast, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or somewhere else. Please feel free to review us and, of course, email us at any time. Jasmine Chan joins us now from Chicago. Her debut novel, and already a bestseller, is called The School for Good Mothers. Jasmine, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So this book has such a delicious, I can't believe nobody has done this yet, premise. Give us the setup of your novel. Well, my novel is about Frida Liu, a Chinese-American single mom who loses custody of her toddler daughter, Harriet, after having one very bad day. And in order to get Harriet back, she has to spend a year at a government-run institution for moms from all over the county whose transgressions range from benign to horrific. So if the mothers don't pass the school's tests, they'll lose their parental rights. And 
the readers will follow her her journey through the school and her her struggle to hold on to her integrity while being indoctrinated. I like to describe the book as a little bit like 1984, but for moms. So this is the most obvious question, but I have to ask it. Where did the idea come from? Because it felt like you took all these threads of, of things we've seen recently. There's a lot of conversation around foster parenthood and why kids get taken away. And it reminded me of Kim Brooks's Small Animals, which is a memoir that came out a few years ago. And I and I think you've mentioned that a story by Rachel Aviv in The New Yorker was one of your direct inspiration. So can you talk a little bit about that story, what struck you about it and other influences? Well, Frida's Very Bad Day definitely grew out of a very good writing day that I had in early 2014. So I'm definitely not someone who sits down with a plan to say, today I'm starting a novel. But what happened was that I was entering my late 30s and I was very, very stressed out about the decision to have a baby or not. And feeling that the time pressure of, of choosing one of those paths And a few months before my very good writing day, I'd read the Rachel Aviv article called Where Is Your Mother, which appeared in The New Yorker in late 2013. And that story is about a single mom who leaves her toddler son at home. And after that, and the neighbors call the police when they hear him crying. And after that day, she never gets him back. And I think something about that story just lodged in my mind. I didn't have it next to me when I started drafting, and I didn't necessarily think about it on a daily basis. But I think it just left a, a kernel of rage inside me. And I, I felt I felt like the what happened to that mom was was so unfair. And I really wanted her to have another chance to raise her son. And it really made me think a lot about the question of the government or any anyone representing the government setting a set of universal standards for parenting or trying to measure things like tenderness or love by some set of data. So so those were the threads that that led to the book. You mentioned that your protagonist, Frida Liu, is Chinese-American, and you mentioned the government's dictating family. I can't help but think that there may be a link between communist China's oversight of parents and until recent one-child policy and its involvement and the way it dictated family life. Was that something that informed this idea as well? I think... Somewhere in my family history and in my mind, like it was informing it. I, it was not directly informing in the sense that I don't think I was super conscious of it, but the Cultural Revolution definitely affected my family's life. And my my father and his siblings and his mother escaped China to move to Hong Kong right before the Cultural Revolution. And he was affected by world events like the Great Leap Forward. So that was definitely part of my family's life that has never really been talked about too much. But it's something that I I read about a lot when I was younger and always had a kind of terrified fascination with the idea of of mind control and re-education. So you mentioned that you felt this rage when you were reading that Rachel Aviv story. What was the source of rage for you? I felt such rage that It felt like the mom in that story could never do anything right because the standards kept changing. And it felt like they were really judging her by a very Western, very American set of parenting standards. So, for example, I think they were critiquing her on on her tone, like when she spoke to her child or, or how much she hugged and kissed him. And that sort of judgment can't help be biased. And so something about that just really stuck with me. And I think I... I ended up becoming kind of obsessed with the subject and and going down the rabbit hole of of reading the other books and articles that she cited and and starting to read more about how the government encroaches on family life. What does it mean to be a bad mother in the invented world of this novel and a good mother? Well, the standards in the book are purposefully set up to be impossible to sort of draw attention to the way that our our culture and society and government sets up such punishing standards for moms. So if if the moms do succeed, it's really by chance. It's not really clear that there is a a way through the system. So there's the tests are are meant to be impossible or taking a a little bit of truth from real life like the idea to pay close attention to your child, but in the world of the book, they can never, ever look away. And their their level of eye contact is, is measured, for example. So really, the net for what constitutes a bad mother could really be anything. It could be the obvious, which is leaving your child at home, hitting your child, 
like classic cases of uh, child abuse and neglect to things like complaining about them on Twitter. So I folded in a, a much broader range of offenses. You mentioned that in addition to governmental interference control demands of parents and of mothers in particular, also the social and cultural demands. And I'm wondering in what ways are those dual forces the same and, and different, and in, in both in real life and in the novel? Well, I'm going to try to answer this question, but it might be a little bit circular. I think one thing that, that struck me as I was contemplating becoming a mother and thinking about American parenting culture was the expectation that moms have to be happy all the time and that there's sort of no room for them to have thornier feelings. I, th I think what's exciting is that the book is coming out at a time when there's a lot of conversation about motherhood. The sad thing about the time in which it's being published is that the world has never been more punishing for parents and for moms than it is right now. But I think that 10 years ago, for example, the books that are coming out about motherhood, like Night Bitch, for example, there wouldn't have been as much room for them as there are now. You began this book before you had kids, and we're still writing it, right? When you became a mother? Yes, I had to rewrite the whole thing, pretty much. I was going to say, how did that change? How did that change the book? I think it's probably not the average journey to parenthood to feel freaked out about having a baby and then start a dystopian novel about motherhood. But that is where my mind went. And I'm sure my daughter will have things to say about that when she's old enough. But I started the book in 2014, and then my daughter was born in early 2017. And it took me about 10 months to get back to writing. But when I started writing again, I found that I had to pretty much reconceive a lot of the lessons. I had to change a lot of very basic things that I got wrong. Like in the earlier drafts, Frida and Harriet had these incredibly long conversations because I had an 18-month-old speaking in paragraphs. I didn't understand the level of ac language acquisition. I didn't necessarily understand a toddler's size. So I had the moms bathing the babies in sinks, for example. I had the moms running through actual fire because I didn't know that I could have the dolls do something simple like trying to not drop food on the floor it would be much harder than running through fire. I mean, those are all sort of practical considerations. Was there anything deeper or more emotional that you felt like, you know what, I, I didn't get that quite right before? Oh, definitely. When I say I had to rewrite everything, I mean completely, completely <laughs> rewriting it. So I think what, what really changed was I think Frida's relationship with Harriet became much richer and it became more, much more possible for me to render a mother's love for a child on the page. I definitely came to motherhood just very nervous about the whole thing. Everyone told me how much I was going to love my child, but that's a very abstract notion until I was actually holding my daughter in my arms and thought, oh, oh okay, I get it. I get, I get the thing that everyone was trying to tell me about. But I think I was also able to make Frida more loving, more vulnerable. She became much warmer. And also she became a much more competent parent because I, I think I had imagined myself failing on every level once I had a baby, just because as anyone who's read my book can tell, I'm a fairly anxious person. <laughs> so I think I didn't understand that I would enjoy some of the rituals like bathing her, or combing her hair, or like helping her get dressed in the morning. So so I think some of the the simpler joys also made it into the book. How do you think your own anxiety comes through in this work of fiction? Like, do you think that readers can detect your anxiety as an author through this book? It's a pretty high anxiety read, I think, from what I've been told. I've been describing it to people as not the most relaxing read, but hopefully worthwhile, because I've definitely been hearing from a lot of people about just how much they cried at the end. And I, I just thank them for, for feeling all the feelings with my characters. But I wove my experience of depression and anxiety into the book because one thing that, that really changed during the writing of the book was I was encouraged by my internist to completely go off antidepressants before trying to get pregnant, which led to this whole mental health crisis during the writing of the book. And so that was one of those things that was completely terrible in real life, but great for the project in the sense that my my real life suffering was became um, more ma material for the the actual narrative. Tell us a little bit more about your main character, Frida. 
Well, I'm going to have to quote my my agent, Meredith Kefel simonoff because she always puts these things best. And she put it best by saying that Frida is a character driven by love. So Frida's in her late 30s. She's newly divorced. She's in a city where she's very isolated from friends and family. She doesn't have a support network. She's working at a job that she doesn't particularly like. And she's definitely just struggling to get by, not sleeping under a lot of stress. But I also think of her as the Chinese-American heroine that I always wanted to read. She's really flawed and desirous and selfish and vulnerable, but I think she has her heart in the right place every step of the way, even if she makes a lot of mistakes. See, there are so many things driving this narrative and different things will strike different readers. But for you as a writer, what most interested you in the story? Was it the plausibility of the idea? Was it how will Frida respond? How will this end? What kind of kept you going as a, as a writer? The thing that kept me going over the years was writing a story that, that came from a really personal inquiry. I, I felt very oppressed, I think, by American parenting culture and the expectations on moms. And I felt very conflicted about entering this culture and having a child. And so the questions and the feelings driving the book definitely came from me. And so I, there were things that I just wanted to say and ask ab- about our world and how we treat moms. So, so that really kept me going. It wasn't necessarily that I was trying to write the most realistic story, but I, I guess I wanted to draw attention to some of the, the things that I read about that really troubled me. The fact that the government does take children from parents thousands of them all around us. And it it only rarely makes the front page news. And so I wanted to draw attention to that issue while also talking about American society. I was going to say, there are some very realistic components to this book, and I don't want to give anything else away about the plot. So I think we will leave it there for readers to discover. It also has this really beautiful kind of Giorgio de Chirico type cover. It's the cover of my dreams. Oh, is it? <laughs> yes, it's it's definitely um, the. I mean, I'm completely obsessed with it. Well, how so? Actually, just tell us a teeny bit about that, and then we'll end there. Well, I I love the pink, which is an important thread in the book. But I also love the the idea that readers are entering a portal to another world because there is a jump in the book from a strictly realistic world to a slightly different world. So I I like the idea that the readers are are going to go go through the doorway with me. All right. We will leave potential readers there. Jasmine, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. Jasmine Chan's new novel, her debut, is called The School for Good Mothers. Alexandra Alter joins us now with some news from the publishing world. Hey, Alexandra. Hey, Pamela. So we've talked for, let's see, two years now about the pandemic and the impact that it's had on the publishing industry, which has not always been even or negative. There's been some real upside seeing people buying more books and book sales surging across all formats. But one thing that I've been watching and waiting for is more literary fiction that addresses or confronts what has occurred since coronavirus hit. And given the gestation period of a novel, we're just starting to see the first trickling of literary fiction from really prominent writers that tackles the pandemic in interesting ways. Some of the books that I'm looking forward to or have read in early copies include Anne Tyler's French Braid that's coming out this March from Knopf. And it's very much an Anne Tyler classic. It looks at generations of a single Baltimore family, but it concludes in the contemporary era when families have been separated and struggled to come together. So that was kind of interesting to see how she, in her own style, with the same preoccupation she always has, was weaving the pandemic into this novel. Other ones that are coming out this year include Roddy Doyle's short story collection, Life Without Children, which looks at the impact of the pandemic on everyday life. And he has, by doing a short story collection, it's interesting, he can zoom in and out on different kinds of characters with different kinds of jobs, the effect on a husband and wife, for example, who maybe had been looking past each other for years, but get to know each other during quarantine, a delivery person who suddenly finds themselves on the front lines, a nurse. And he talked to me about how he felt like 
he was working on this novel that suddenly, when the pandemic hit, just didn't feel realistic anymore. So he had to switch gears. And a number of the writers that I've spoken to who have decided to write about the pandemic said similar things. Like, this became such a life-transforming event for almost everyone on the planet that it couldn't be ignored in fiction. Of course, that presents other interesting narrative problems. You can't always control the timing of a book. I think there's some concern about, are people going to want to read about the pandemic next year or later this year? Are people done with it? Do they want to read more escapist fiction? How much do you make your book about the pandemic or do you just try to capture the atmosphere? Some writers I spoke to said they wrote the novel that they would have written in any case, but they're kind of adding little details like characters putting on a mask to go into a store or something like that to signal to the reader that this is a pandemic time novel, but it's not necessarily a pandemic novel. So there's this fine line that writers are trying to walk. And this has already become, just like the pandemic itself, a kind of polarizing subject. There was an interesting op-ed in the Los Angeles Times that the writer Tom Bissell published where he basically admonished people not to write pandemic novels. He pointed out, and I did a little research, and he was correct about this, that the 1918 flu pandemic produced very little in the way of literary fiction. Writers were not directly responding to that pandemic in their work. I think people wanted to move on. It was so traumatic. It was right after the war, and there was just so much exhaustion from mass global trauma. So you did see the 1918 flu come up in works later, but these were often decades later. And if it was evoked, it was very subtle. People would talk about ringing the church bells for the dead or something like that, but they wouldn't directly write about it. So Tom Bissell argued there's a reason there's not a lot of literature because a mass disease is not a great organizing principle for a novel. It's not a very good adversary. It's random. It's invisible. It affects everyone. He was saying, don't do it. Stay away from it. And of course, And you have other writers chiming in on Twitter, where else? Like Gary Steingart, who wrote a pandemic novel, Our Country Friends, that came out last fall, got great reviews. He said, counterpoint, write whatever the bleep you want. I can't say it on our podcast, but you can fill in the blank. So it started an interesting debate, I think, about how do you take this really insane world event and weave it into a story? Is it a distraction? Is it part of the atmosphere? Can you leave it out? Or is that weird. So it's something that a lot of writers are thinking about even in their next books that they're planning for 2023. Well, I'm going to mention a book that I've mentioned at least four times on this podcast over the years, but it is so good, which is William Maxwell's They Came Like Swallows, which was about the 1918 pandemic, specifically about his mother's death, and it was an autobiographical novel. So one of the few good things, fiction-wise, to come out of that tragedy But the other thing, and I'm curious how you feel about this, Alexandra, is looking at TV as another form that's trying to grapple with, like, to what extent do you have things take place during the pandemic or not? Like, what is it like for you watching TV shows where there's no pandemic? I sometimes have this kind of knee-jerk reaction of, like, where are your masks? How are you all sitting around just talking? I do have that reaction, too. And I'm wanting to lean into anxiety. So I inhaled all of Station Eleven. I binged it. This is an adaptation of Emily St. John Mandel's pandemic novel, which actually came out in 2014. But the show on HBO came out this year. And so they actually had to make it during the pandemic. And I think it really changed the experience for the showrunners and all the actors. So yeah, I like to embrace the anxiety and sort of the, the other thing that's great about her novel and the show is that their pandemic is much worse than ours. So in some ways, it, it can make you feel better. I did read a really interesting piece from our TV critic, James Panawazic, looking at how shows are either putting the pandemic in the past by ignoring it, or he used the example of the Sex and the City reboot on HBO, the sort of flick at it by saying, remember when we all had to stand six feet apart? So sort of giving the viewer clues that we're not in the pandemic anymore. We're in some indefinite future in the near future, which is, you know, I'll take the optimism, <laughs> whether it <laughs> whether it's good narratively or for TV, I'm not as sure. But it'll be quite interesting to see the work that comes out of this pandemic. It took fiction writers a f- few years sometimes to metabolize 9-11, but you saw some really interesting fiction about that tragedy. And I think similarly, writers say it's our job to process these huge world events and what they mean for everyday life. And so 
Some people are going to do that by just telling an individual story and not necessarily addressing what the pandemic meant on a big societal or political or global health level, but looking at what it meant to live through it and what it felt like. So I'm looking forward to a lot of these books. Another one I forgot to mention that was announced recently, but won't come out till the fall, is Ian McEwan's novel. Knopf will be publishing that in September, and it's titled Lessons, and it's this entire life story of this man who's roughly McEwan's age is in his 70s. He lives in London. And so in the final sections of the novel, the pandemic has occurred and he's reflecting back on his life. Well, maybe it'll prove more enjoyable to read about the pandemic than to live in a pandemic. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'm betting it will be. All right, Alexandra, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. My colleagues Greg Coles and John Williams join us now to talk about what we're reading. Hey, guys. Hey, Pamela. Hey, Pamela. Hey, Greg. Greg, let's start with you. Hey, John. Well, I'm still reading 2666 by Roberto Bolaño, but it's going slow and I'm not at the femicide section yet. So as I have said previously on the podcast, I'm uh, not going to talk about that one just yet. What I've also picked up in the meantime, partly because of Janet Maslin's review of it, and partly just because this is an author I've never read that I know, Pamela, you like, and our colleagues Tina Jordan and Liz Egan really like her a lot also, is Jennifer Haig, who has several novels behind her now. And her new one is called Mercy Street. It is set in Boston on Mercy Street, a, a small street off of the common that Anne Sexton wrote a poem called Mercy Street about that street, about trying to to find a house that she remembered there. And in this Jennifer Haig novel, Mercy Street is where a women's clinic is, an abortion clinic, where the main character, Claudia, works as a phone counselor and an intake counselor, bringing clients in. So it's a book very much about abortion and about women's rights. And I was a little bit hesitant to pick it up because of that. There's always a danger with these kind of hot button topical political subjects that the author will feel the need to preen and soapbox. But Janet's review and Janet herself in in talking to her about this book convinced me that that's not what Jennifer Haig is all about. And in fact, she's not at all. We really get a lot about Claudia's background. She grew up poor in Maine in a trailer, and Jennifer Haig specifies it's a single-wide trailer, not a double-wide trailer, which makes all the difference in the world. It's essentially like a shipping container with a mother who was very badly equipped to be a mother and took on lots of foster children just because the state gave her money to raise them. It was the only way that she knew of to make a living, but really not much of a caretaker, not much of a mother at all. And so Claudia has had to make a life for herself. And after a brief stint working at a women's magazine in her 20s. She quit. She moves to Boston. She starts volunteering at this clinic and then is hired. And as the book opens, she's been there for like nine years. The book opens on Ash Wednesday, and there's a fairly large group of protesters outside the clinic, which apparently is is the case every Ash Wednesday. It starts the Lent protest season at abortion clinics. So you, you have this immediate sense of conflict and tension and and that there's going to be a run-in. And then Jennifer Haig subverts that expectation. It pulls you along expecting the conflict. And there's lots of conflict in the book, but it's not what you expect. It's not the violent sniper or, or bomb attack or anything like that. And in fact, as much as we go into Claudia's life, we also go into the backgrounds and lives of many of the protesters. One in particular, a guy named Victor, who has, over the years, become more and more radicalized, listening to right-wing radio. And he's very much a loner. He is, in fact, a former army sniper. And the book is set in 2015, and you really get the feeling that she's as interested in Victor and his radicalization as she is in standing on a soapbox for freedom of choice. And she's looking at this whole question of how somebody becomes radicalized. And so it's it feels not accidental that it's set in 2015, before the 2016 election, when political polarization was so much in the forefront of everybody's attention. So that's what I've been reading. John, how about you? I am about halfway through a novel by the British writer Sarah Perry. It's her first book. It's called After Me Comes the Flood, which I love as a title. 
it was published in 2014 in the UK. It was published to really strong reviews over there as a debut. I think it even won the Guardian's first novel prize. And I think was only published in the US a couple of years ago after she became a bit more well-known here for her ensuing novels, one of which is called The Essex Serpent and one of which is called Melmoth, M-E-L-M-O-T-H. So I picked this up because I someone online had recommended it somewhere. And it's unlike things that I usually read. It's quite gripping. It's a mystery almost. It's like a metaphysical mystery. There's this guy named John Cole who owns a bookstore in London, and he closes up shop one day and he goes to visit his brother on the coast during a heat wave and a drought. And on his way there, his car breaks down and he walks through these woods and he comes upon this very large ramshackle but once stately mansion or home. And as he gets to the door, someone opens it and greets him very enthusiastically as if they've been waiting for him. And they even say his name. And he's quite confused and he walks in. And as he gets the lay of the land, he realizes that this group of people who live there, there's a matronly type, there's an older guy, there are a few young people, and it's unclear what their relationship to each other is, but that they all have been expecting someone with his name to come and stay in a room there. And he doesn't really take the opportunity ever to disabuse them of this idea that he's the wrong guy. And he's wondering what's happening. He's trying to figure out you know, where he is and what this is. He's at the point I'm at, he's becoming closer to this young guy named Alex, who, and this is where the the title of the book comes from, as far as I can tell, believes that a nearby reservoir is going to burst. The dam is going to burst and that the water is going to flood the house away. And it's a little bit gothic, as you can probably tell. It's very subtle. There are portents and there are feelings of dread, but it's not done in capital letters. And in some ways, it's just a kind of quiet story about these people who live in this house and who they are and him getting to know them. And I'm glad I'm only halfway through because it means that I literally can't spoil it. And I I wouldn't want to be tempted to because I don't know if it will end with some clear description of what is actually happening and whether this is a dream or real or who they think he is. But either way, it's that central thing that keeps you reading. And I, I found it very engaging. And I, I have wanted to read her other novels, and I'm sure I'll get to them someday, but I'm I'm starting with this one. Pamela, what about you? What are you reading these days? Well, I finally finished Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens, and I feel like I could devote four podcast conversations to the novel, but I'm going to try to keep it to one. So this is Dickens's last complete novel, so late Dickens, and it is 800 pages. Really gets going, I would say, at around page 375. Um, but but then, you know, it's you really, it moves along. And, you know, like so many Dickens novels, very multi-character, lots of digressions. This one is about the way in which money corrupts. And it starts off with a really atmospheric scene for those of us who like things like the rivers and, and people who collect stuff along the rivers, which is like, I think, a whole subculture. This starts off with a scene of the people whose job it is to collect dead bodies out of the Thames. And it begins with a body that's discovered. And there is a case of mistaken identity that forms really the biggest plot device of the book is someone who is not who he seems, as it so often is not only in the works of Dickens, but everywhere else. And there's lots of eccentric characters. I think my favorite characters in the book well, no, I won't say my favorite, but one couple that I really like are the Lamleys, Arthur and Sophronia Lamley, who have been married by, and here's a Dickensian name, the Veneerings. The Veneerings, this very rich, obviously superficial couple, has introduced the Lamleys to one another, and they are each under the impression that they are marrying into money, whereas neither of them have any money, and it's on their honeymoon where they realize that not only did neither of them marry rich, but together they're broke. And so they've been tricked into this, hoodwinked into it by the veneerings, and so decide to basically spend the rest of their marriage united in scheming and revenge and just trying to get by financially. And I'm just going to read a teeny little paragraph describing them at the end of the night of scheming. And thus the Lamleys got home at last, and the lady sat down, moody and weary, looking at her dark lord engaged in a deed of violence with a bottle of soda water, as though he were wringing the neck of some unlucky creature and pouring its blood down his throat. 
As he wiped his dripping whiskers in an ogreish way, he met her eyes and pausing said with no very gentle voice, well, I'll end there. So there's a lot of really great descriptions. There's another character, Podsnap, Mr. Podsnap, and the chapter that introduces him is is called Podsnappery. I'm going to read to you from the introduction of the character, Mr. Podsnap. Mr. Podsnap was well-to-do and stood very high in Mr. Podsnap's opinion. Beginning with a good inheritance, he had married a good inheritance, and he had thriven exceedingly in the marine insurance way and was quite satisfied. He never could make out why everybody was not quite satisfied, and he felt conscious that he set a brilliant social example in being particularly well-satisfied with most things, and above all other things, with himself. Thus, happily acquainted with his own merit and importance, Mr. Podsnap settled that whatever he put behind him, he put out of existence. There was a dignified conclusiveness not to add a grand convenience in this way of getting rid of disagreeables, which had done much towards establishing Mr. Podsnap in his lofty place in Mr. Podsnap's satisfaction. I don't want to know about it. I don't choose to discuss it. I don't admit it. Mr. Podsnap had even acquired a peculiar flourish of his right arm in often clearing the world of its most difficult problems by sweeping them behind him and consequently sheer away with those words and a flushed face, for they <laughs> affronted him. I just thought, you know what? I w- <laughs> That's great. I, not only are, are there so many Podsnaps <laughs> out there, uh, but, you know, there's something there's something a little bit alluring about, you know, living the life of a Podsnap. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wish I was Podsnap. <laughs> That's right. I have to admit that I am vastly underread in Dickens. I read Great Expectations in high school, but I haven't read anything else. You know, I think I have a new Christmas tradition of reading either Dickens or something Victorian around Christmas time. I used to go up to this house that we would rent in Vermont over the Christmas holidays, mostly to ski, but also to read by the fire. And that ceased during the pandemic. We could no longer rent that house. But it was there that I started the habit, I think, with Bleak House which I read by the fire. And now I realize, you know what, I'm just going to make a fire at home, damn it, and uh, and pick up my Dickens novel here. So that's what I did. Each of the past three years or so, I've started each year with a particular friend promising that we read Bleak House together. And it hasn't happened yet, but hopefully soon. Oh, it's worth it. It's worth it. And a few other things I just want to mention really quickly about this book. One is in this book, he, Dickens, I think, tries to make amends for the perceived and probably actual anti-Semitism of Oliver Twist, which, of course, he later went back and rewrote Fagin a little bit to address some of those anti-Semitic stereotypes. But here he creates an entire character. Some might say he overcorrected and that the Jewish character in this book is a paragon of goodness. And then another character, this was sort of intriguing, but ended in disappointment. There's a character in the book named Jenny Wren, who is born with some kind of very serious physical disablement. She can't really walk. And she, her father is a drunk. A just a, a, It's a really, very actually modern description of alcoholism in her father. And so from a very young age, she's assumed the role of parent of her own father and very blatantly treats him as a child. And he is like a child. And her name is Jenny Wren. And I mention that because simultaneous with finishing this book, I was watching the Beatles documentary, the Peter Jackson Beatles documentary, Get Back. And probably like many people after seeing the episode in which Paul McCartney, you know, writes Get Back in the space of like 10 minutes of just kind of sheer and overwhelming genius, I went down a Paul McCartney rabbit hole on Spotify And he wrote a song called Jenny Wren, and I was just all set to just discover this hidden Dickens fan in Paul McCartney, especially after having interviewed Paul Muldoon on the podcast and looked at his book of lyrics. I thought, well, maybe, you know, there's there's no reason why he wouldn't write a song about the character Jenny Wren from Our Mutual Friend. But to my disappointment, it's really about kind of a bird, (laughs) like a a woman slash bird. It's it's not about uh, Jenny Wren of Our Mutual Friend, but the song has been in my head ever since. All right, let's quickly run down the names of the books we read this week, starting with you, Greg. I'm reading Mercy Street by Jennifer Haig. I'm reading After Me Comes the Flood by Sarah Perry. And I read Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens. Like so many girls, Jenny Wren could sing. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back, 
Not right away, but I do. The Book Review Podcast is produced by the great Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media with a major assist from my colleague John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. <laughs>